thank you very thank you very much indeed peter for that warm introduction uh, on a warm day and all the rest of it so it's a great pleasure to be here and it's a particular honor uh, to be able to ask to address you first of all the thing i'm most mindful of at the moment is that i am keeping you from the reception and if any of you seeing me in my drinking mode then you'll realize that my needs probably greater than yours but nevertheless we'll see how we get on but i'll try and get through this fairly briskly so then um I fear a little bit of this will be familiar to Peter from last year, but we'll get on to that later on. But um, it seemed to me important, and I'll make sure I've got the right buttons to push. Is this, is this, this is the one to use here, is it? Yeah, that's great. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I thought um, we should reflect a little bit more widely to begin with, um, and remember, of course, belonging to Western societies, there are a number of things which we take with extreme seriousness. Uh, fairness, very keen on fairness. Yes, I like fairness, yeah. So does David Cameron, apparently. Um, another thing is choice. Choice is very, very important, because if we don't have choice, then really we're not exercising our proper faculties. So I have taken the precaution of bringing three alternative lectures for you, in case they are of greater interest. Um, now, the first one, and I will ask for a show of hands, as is customary, if I can get this, if I can get this to work. No, I can't. Does it need to come on to go off? That's advanced. No, no. Let's try this one here. Yeah, that's going to be simpler. Um, are any of you perhaps interested in... This is a crucial, crucial period in the Peruvian uh, railway industry. Uh, after 22, when the narrow-gauge issue had been finally settled, it really becomes a pretty boring story of any interest to PhD students. But um, no, not so much interest. OK, well, so be it. Um, another area which I know you feel very strongly about, and so do I, is what in this country we call elf and safety health and safety. And I hope that all of you have got some sort of risk assessment with you, intellectual if nothing else. And um, there are a few areas, though, under health and safety, which seem to me just utterly neglected. And these, these are areas of such serious oversight that I cannot believe that they can exist in a democratic society. And amongst those, of course, one of the most striking is the issue of high altitude ironing. Because, you know, here too. It's simply ridiculous. You know, the risks they take, you know, the lack of, the lack of forms, the lack of... You see, he's not even wearing a high-visibility jacket, for goodness sake. It's just a, a set of disasters and the like. But the third alternative talk, and I think with an audience like this might be the one which resonates mo most immediately, is, of course, the deep and absorbing area of Labrador metaphysics. You know. <laughs> Labradors do it differently. Of that, there's no doubt. But, unfortunately, I'm booked in to talk about this. Um, and... In essence, you do see where I am, don't you? Good. Um, in essence, um, I've come to the uh, conclusion, sad or otherwise, that evolutionary convergence is becoming much, much too popular. And um, I think it's time to move on, because in my own view, as soon as an area becomes of, of, of interest uh, and people take it for granted, then it loses all interest to me at all. I put this slide in actually for two reasons, and this is an aside which I've been thinking about a great deal. Uh, recently, I'm just halfway through Christopher Clarke's book called *The Sleepwalkers*. It's about the origins of the First World War, and if you don't know it or haven't read it, I very warmly recommend it to you. It's, ex it's extraordinarily interesting, and even I think, from a theological view, if I may say so, Peter, one of the things which strikes me about that book is just how unbelievably nasty almost everybody was. It's just extraordinary in terms of the governments. It's just just vicious, not on a large scale. But the other thing I shall say in parenthesis, because this is very topical in this country at the moment, is speaking entirely personally, it's nothing to do with my talk, but I do want to say it, because I feel rather strongly about it, is it strikes me as absolutely remarkable the way Europe has managed to engage in self-suicide 50 years on schedule. And here we go again. We've just elected, or haven't elected, a person who says it's quite all right to lie in public discourse. He's a man called Juncker. And I must say, this strikes me as very, very strange indeed. It's always different, but it's always nasty. And I have to say that popularity can go in some strange directions. But today, I want to address briefly what I call evolutionary myths. And by these, of course, first of all, I must insist I'm not at all disputing the Darwinian framework. Uh, if any of you are creationists or inclined that way, then I would go for a walk in the sun. You won't learn anything here. Correspondingly, though, um, it seems to me that uh, there are areas of received wisdom which are overdue for, as what we say in English, a really good kicking. There are areas where we, I think things are taken for granted. And these, of course, are not fairy tales or anything like that. These are not make-believe areas in that sense, nor are they a mythology, which I'll come on to if I have time right at the end. It's more to do with this notion that everybody says, yes, 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 Richard, yes, 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 Jerry, these things, you know, we, everybody knows that and all the like. 
And this strikes me as slightly peculiar because, as alluded to very briefly and kindly by Peter with regards to predictability, which seems to be more or less the core of a scientific enterprise, which evolution is largely thought to be devoid, um, correspondingly, if you talk to physicists, it's got worse. I think they thought they'd lost 80% of the visible universe. It's now 95% of the visible universe. They're really doing crackingly well at the moment. So in this respect, and because we're devising a new website, which is going to uh, try and encourage younger people in particular, that there really is a future in this subject. There are far horizons, which we talk about mostly over gin and tonics, but nevertheless are areas of profound interest, um, rather than, if I may say so, the view just up the road in North Oxford, where everything is being basically sorted out once and for all. And there's really nothing else to talk about except give each other medals. I mean, there we are, uh, which I don't approve of either. So um, the point, of course, as will be familiar to most of you, especially if you're from the United States or Australia, or indeed some parts of the Islamic world now, for that matter, is that irrespective of where you stand on the arguments for particular sorts of evolution, nevertheless, the world at large, the public, for want of a better term, are profoundly interested in who they are and why things matter, and their suspicion is sometimes uh, raised uh, when they are regarded either as idiots or in other sorts of respects are regarded as somehow being um, of irrelevance to the current discourse in evolutionary biology. In other words, if you don't believe it, there must be something wrong with you. Whereas they, of course, I think are generally mistaken in what evolution actually is. But this is epitomized from the very early days of Darwinism, of course, by this gentleman here, Thomas Henry Huxley, enthroned in the Natural History Museum, which, of course, most of you will know, he and Darwin actually tried to prevent the building of that Natural History Museum. Largely, I think, because of their animus against Richard Owen, but nevertheless, the building was built, and it's a wonderful museum to the present day. So the point about this is that although the history has changed, and although things like creationism and an American cultural experience, which I find utterly baffling, but despite all that, these are things which engage very large numbers of people, and we need to be able to address it. Now, in part, what has inspired me for really the last 30 years, in a rather paradoxical way, has been some of the thinking of Stephen Jay Gould, and he wrote very generously about our work on the Burgess Shale, and some of you will probably know this book. It's a little prolix, but there we go, called Wonderful Life, where he was exploring uh, not so much the wonders of the discoveries, which uh, Derek Briggs, myself, and Harry Whittington were very privileged to, um, to work on, but a more general metaphysical stance, which is very familiar to many of you, which was to the effect that were we, quote, to rerun the tape of life, and here we have, I think this might work, in fact, our profession. If we were to rerun the tape of life, ignoring this very deep pre-Cambrian history, we can talk about that if you're, if you're interested. It's the most fascinating interval. Um, but since the Cambrian explosion about half a billion years ago, we now have a, a, a biosphere that populated with a remarkable diversity of forms, which includes, of course, sperm whales or elephants or whatever your favourite group is, or hair there, or indeed ourselves here. And the thesis of Gould, which is widely shared amongst the neo-Darwinian community, is that all of these are complete and utter evolutionary accidents. In other words, they are so unlikely to evolve other than through the particular twists and turns of history. And this is something which, of course, very much resonates with intellectual history because uh, people are particularly interested in counterfactuals and a very large number of books. And also science fiction, in my view, deals with this in some very interesting fashions to ask what would have happened if the story of history had gone in a slightly different direction. And we do know that on occasion things are redirected by apparently utterly trivial courses. Two sets of essays edited by Robert Cowley, of which this is the second one, entitled, as you can read yourself, More What If, explore all sorts of possibilities. Again, uh, the cover of this is, uh, is, is Hitler's victory parade in London in April 14th, 1941. We all remember it's a glorious day. It's a glorious day. And of course, I also have to remind you, or do I, of course, that everybody in the rally here is English. Of course, that goes without saying. Um, it's perfectly likely that if Churchill had not been elected to Premier, and if in particular Halifax had, and again without going into all the details, we would have very probably come to an accommodation with the Germans. It wouldn't have been a surrender, but nevertheless it would have been disastrous for Europe and the world and also for this country, in my opinion. And if you don't know the book, Robert Sampson's Dominion is a wonderful exploration of how the world was in England in about 1951, the, day, the year I was born, um, as to what it was like under German control. It turns out, for instance, that Erwin Rommel is the ambassador in London, so you get the sort of general mixture of the area. And I find these alternative possibilities extremely chilling in a number of ways. And in this book, and this is one which has particularly fascinated me and will perhaps be of interest to So in this, um, in this particular uh, set of essays, there's this one here which won't need to the great majority of you any particular explanation, but was to inquire what would have happened if the procurator in AD 33 Jerusalem had sent to the prisoner standing beside him, you're free. 
and then said very quietly, in the very best of luck, how of history being different? Well, one can make arguments from what is known about the relationship between Pontius Pilate and Sejanus in Rome and various other things that this is extremely unlikely to have happened. But Pontius Pilate presumably had free will. He wasn't particularly keen on the Jews. That was obvious enough. And it's not absolutely inconceivable that Jesus would have been released. And I recommend this essay to you, in fact, because the denouement at the end is extraordinarily ingenious and theologically very interesting indeed. Um, and it's a very well-written account of an alternative history. In its, in its own way. So these things I think are genuinely fascinating and they're ones which I think also might apply in certain respects to evolutionary history. Um, now the reason why this has become um, of more relevance is that um, as again most of you will be aware um, the realisation that there were very numerous extrasolar planets uh, has not only been dramatically confirmed but something which was I think unexpected some 15 years ago is that a very, very large number of those are of Earth-like form. That is, they're probably ones which gravity is not exerting a massive tyranny. And a number of these are located in what appear to be habitable zones. And the numbers of such planets are stupendously large, even in this Milky Way. So if this is the case, then if you were to subscribe to my ideas to do with evolutionary convergence, which I, I'm still very interested in, I just think it's, it's becoming too popular, so I don't want to work on it anymore, um, are that, in fact, there should be a very large number of extraterrestrials for whom we might like to have a conversation at some stage. And I'll come back to this in due course. So, in a certain sort of way, <clears throat> the recent work, especially by Kepler, but the other methods of exoplanet uh, detection, um, I think are potentially one of the most exciting areas because within a few years, we will be able to pinpoint specific star systems and actually concentrate on them rather than just listening widely and trying to see if anybody's there or not, as the case might be. Now, let's see if this carries on working. No, it doesn't like that. No, oh dear, sorry. Do I have to go down like this? No, no, come on, you idiot. Is there another way of advancing this? Or? No, no. Sorry. Oh, here it comes. Oh, maybe it's just shy. Yeah, that could be it. My name's Simon. How do you do? And as Peter very generously mentioned, um, this is a book I published some 10 years ago where my thesis is, in fact, that something in ourselves is evolutionarily basically inevitable. And I think the arguments for that are actually stronger than they were when I wrote the book, which is mildly gratifying. Uh, but, in fact, we're completely alone, which is absolutely ridiculous and can't be right, and therefore I should be sacked. Um, in passing, um, the life solution, uh, I, I mentioned this in passing elsewhere. The reason I gave it this title was to make sure they ended up on the self-help shelves of bookshops, you know, don't have all these people, you know, ra rather than investigating crystals or tarot cards or something like that, then they would be able to, um, to, to buy my book instead. So, Terribly slow. No? What else should I do with this apart from kill it? No, oh, all right. Okay, that's what I do. So I'm now going to take you as quickly as I can, allowing for the machine's vagaries, um, through a, era, a series of, of what I like to call evolutionary myths. And the first one, which I'll probably spend a bit more time on, is the one to deal with mass extinctions. Now, by the way, with respect to myths, I'm not for a moment disputing the reality of mass extinctions. Uh, of course there are mass extinctions. We know that perfectly well. Um, what I'm going to try and persuade you is actually they, they do something rather different from what you might, you might first expect. And I think I'm just going to keep on taking this stupid thing down. Sorry. You can see the joke slides coming up in advance, which will be good for all of us, I think. There we go. Now, so far as mass extinctions today are concerned, of course, it's uh, a matter of common knowledge that as a highly intelligent species, we're trashing the biosphere. I don't think this is an ethical comment, but I think it's going to be very difficult for any intelligent species not to do that when it takes over the entire planet. And this is a little microcosm of exactly what happened. Here we have, in fact, the founder of the Natural History Museum, Richard Owen, and he's standing beside a giant moa, which... Uh, as you will largely know, is an extinct bird from New Zealand, which was uh, given its size, not surprisingly flightless. Uh, these guys were consumed within 100 years of the Polynesians arriving. They were turned into fricassees, stews, soups, all the rest of it, barbecues, and everything else. And there's no doubt that once a species such as ourselves arrives, then indeed all bets are off. But on the other hand, the thing which surprises me slightly, if I can persuade this thing, come on. Sorry, this is very boring. There we are. Okay. Is that if you go down to the University Museum here in Oxford, which I recommend, even more the Pitt Rivers behind it, if you've not visited it, extraordinary place, is if you go to any museum of paleontology, 
just about every species you see there is extinct. And actually I find that mildly puzzling because uh, species are robust, well adapted, occur in large numbers, but there we are. The average longevity of the species, I suppose, is something like two million years or, or some, something of that particular order. I see. I'm getting the hang of this. This is quite good fun. Actually, I'm just going to try something in a minute. So, so far as that's concerned, then the general idea is that extinction goes on continuously. But on the other hand, if you look at the diversity of life, and um, Jack's son David is here, so he doesn't need an introduction to this. This is a very famous curve devised by his dad, Jack Sepkoski, in Chicago, and shows the increase in diversity with the uh, plateau here, another decrease, and then an increase here. But punctuated by these five major events, which are often called the five big ones, either five principal mass extinctions. GOBE, when I first looked at this side, I thought this was some sort of new European currency, but no, it's actually the Great Ordovician Biodiversity Event, which in its own way actually dwarfs the more famous Cambrian explosion. Um, so that, that's something which gives us an overall framework. Now, of these events, no, it doesn't like it, does it? Sorry. Of these events, the most famous, um, justifiably in a number of respects, is that which happened 65 million years ago, on a June day, if we're interested, um, which involved, this is true, um, I wouldn't make it up, um, paleobotanical evidence, um, the arrival of an asteroid about 10 kilometres diameter, which then powered the mass extinction, which of course led to the... Um, so what I was trying to explain very briefly is that one looks at mass extinctions, the general idea is that they are not only completely catastrophic, but they also radically redirect the course of evolution. So they more or less wipe the ecological slate clean. So I mentioned a moment ago, we say goodbye to the dinosaurs, we say goodbye to the pterosaurs up there in the oceans. We say, if I can get to work, we say goodbye to these mosasaurs. Uh, the ichthyosaurs have gone extinct in the mid-Cretaceous. These are a group of marine lizards, actually closely related to the Komodo dragon. Very, very interesting set of stories there. And they too are part of the standard roster of, of extinctions in this time. And as mentioned, the view would be that the world changes dramatically. And this is most obvious in the late Permian mass extinctions, which separate the Paleozoic from the Mesozoic. And I'll refer to those in passing in a few minutes. And correspondingly, that between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary, the loss of the dinosaurs, the rise of the mammals, and all these sorts of things. So these are seen as fulcrum points in evolution. And as I already stressed, um, ones which are, for all intents and purposes, accidental. Who's to say when the next asteroid is going to arrive out of the sky without any warning? Those of you who are geologists will know it's more complicated than that. Volcanism is, in fact, far more important. But that doesn't really change the uh, overall view. Whereas what I'm going to try and persuade you is that when you lift the curtain of the mass extinction, what you see beyond is pretty well the same as what you'll see behind you, that there really is almost no difference. So there's a rather important um, little twist in this, which I'll come on to in a moment. Now, one of the things which interests me, although I can make no claims to be an intellectual historian, unlike Peter, despite my interest in European history, is that it seems to me that although science is, in a sense, a cultural activity, and Michael Roos, I'm sure, would agree with that, and it undoubtedly governs the way we tend to look at things, of course, it doesn't actually decide what's scientific truth. There isn't an Islamic algebra or a feminist geometry, at least not so far as I'm aware. I hope there is in any case. But the fact of the matter is that I think it's fair to say that so far as our society is concerned, and this is actually reflected in what's going on in Europe at the moment, in a number of ways in my view, it's a very pessimistic society. It's not one which in any way is laden with optimism. And it believes that in one way or another the world is going to end in fire. And I don't think it's entirely accidental that these sort of apocalyptic views of the end of civilization in one form or another, it could be global cloomy, Global, global cooling, global warming, it doesn't really matter very much, it's going to be horrible when it happens, is reflected in the characteristic pictures of the mass extinction. So here we have just one of hundreds, where here we have the enormous asteroids screaming dinosaurs and red hot lumps of rock flying through the stuff. The whole thing's unbelievably disastrous with massive forest fires and all the rest of it. And if it's bad on land, then let's go down to the shore and perhaps get away and, and, and have some sort of escape. You forget it. If you, if you have a tsunami around about five kilometres in height, then obviously being a brontosaurus isn't going to do you a great deal of good. These things happen. The evidence for tsunamis, the evidence for massive forest fires, all these are clearly encoded in the rock record. I'm not disputing those at all. It's a wider view which I'm interested in. The first thing to remember although it's obvious, I suppose, is that so far as a fossil record is concerned, it's always dangerous. There's never a safe period. 
things are always under competition and stress, whether you subscribe to the Red Queen hypothesis of Van Valen or other methods of competitive interaction, the struggle for existence, as Darwin so clearly explained to us, um, you're, you're never going to be able to sort of just relax and have a Sunday off. It's just not allowed, I'm afraid. Another thing is which interests me, and I think this is really more sociology, um, is the terminology which goes with mass extinctions. <clears throat> and so, for instance, after the Permian mass extinction, the fossil record, at least in some parts of the world, seems to be made almost entirely of this group of mammal-like reptiles, they're called cynodonts, and this plant here, it's a sort of lycopod. And you'll see the depiction is glowering grey sky and all the rest of it. And these are referred to as disaster species. So it seems to be that a handful of, of species are able to flourish in an environment where nearly everybody else has gone to the wall. And you get the general sense that these plants taste absolutely disgusting. You know, it's a really <laughs> utterly, utterly miserable time. There are disaster species, but again, disaster, I mean, in what sense does biology know what disaster means? Corresponding, though, we forget too often, this is true even of the Permian mass extinction, which by all accounts was the most catastrophic of all, where David Raup famously calculated to some degree of accuracy on an interesting method of extrapolation that something in the order of 90% or more of all marine species went extinct. Now, this is probably correct, but the fact of the matter is that even in this the most um, stressed time in the last 500 million years, there are areas which effectively are refuges, mostly located in what are parts of northwest Canada. They didn't escape unscathed, but the severity of the extinctions are very much less. And of course, as Darwin would remind us, you only need a few pools of diversity, and the capacity for a planet to repopulate itself at really record speed is not in question at all. So it's effectively very, very difficult to sterilize a planet. It's almost impossible. The other thing, and again, a number of you will know this story, so I don't have to go into the details, but um, quite often, around about mass extinctions, one finds a species which disappears, apparently a victim of the mass extinction, and a couple of million years later, good heavens, it's back again. And of course, those of you who know the famous account in John's Gospel of the resurrection of Lazarus, and a whole set of very interesting theological questions surrounding this episode, of course. And well, I, find it's, I think it's intellectually a little lazy to call them Lazarus tax, but David Jablonski coined it, and he's a very, very bright chap and a very nice guy as well. But what we forget, more importantly, is a fossil record is full of Lazarus taxa for the very simple reason the fossil record is extremely incomplete. Fossil species are constantly disappearing and reappearing. But because people focus on the mass extinction, then this term Lazarus taxa takes some priority. Correspondingly, not only are there Lazarus taxa which disappear and then reappear with a slightly sheepish smile on their face, there are also, even the more interesting, Elvis taxa. <laughs> now, Elvis taxa are taxa which come back but are fakes. They're not the real thing. They're not the king. And these, of course, is just a small example of convergent evolution. These are ones which re-evolve and very much in the same sort of way. And they can be quite confusing. Did that thing really go extinct or is it just a mimic which we're seeing afterwards? And then finally, and this is the one which I, in its own way I find the most interesting, come on, don't be shy, are what's called dead clades walking. Now, a clade is a group of species. And in essence, what you sometimes find is after a mass extinction, a rather successful group does survive, but in greatly diminished numbers and diversity. And then after a few million years, it totters off the precipice and goes extinct. And the problem with this is that this seems to be exercising um, hindsight in spade loads. It's, you know, it's like watching the sleepwalker going along the parapet. You're saying, God, don't, don't. Shall we wake her up? What do we do? So you see this thing tottering towards extinction. The fossil record is full of dead clades walking. In fact, there's a fascinating set of stories of species which sometimes live for 100 million years past their sell-by date, or even, and it's slightly related to the Lazarus tax, so think of the coelacanth. Okay, it turns up in a fisherman's net in 1938, I think it was. It had disappeared completely from the fossil record from the end of the Cretaceous. Not a single fossil is being found. It's very strange. Where on earth were they? So this terminology, I find in its own way, quite revealing about the mindsets which tend to work on mass extinctions, which are also, in my view, too popular. Now, again, this is not to dispute for a moment the reality of the mass extinction. They are very bad times. Diversity plummets. There are disaster species and all the rest of it. The biosphere is under major stress. But once again, what I want to encourage you to do, although this is great fun to teach, and of course in terms of geology bringing together many lines of inquiry is deeply satisfying, if we take a slightly wider view, one says, well, in the grand scheme of things, Let's consider just one test case. <clears throat> this is a particularly useful one because it involves this wonderful group of arthropods known as the trilobites. And they are very abundant in the Paleozoic, and they are indeed victims of the Permian mass extinction 250 million years ago. That's fine and large. However, if you look at the diversity, 
crudely the number of species of trilobites through geological time, effectively from round about the mid-Paleozoic, they're really becoming pretty uncommon. By the time you get to the Permian, they are rare. They are on a continuous downstream line. And Ralph again wrote a very interesting paper called, uh, to do with the extinction called Bad Genes or Bad Luck. And the argument here is that it doesn't matter how many spines or other defensive things you might attach to your body, the fact of the matter is that the world is getting more dangerous. In the Silurian, if not slightly earlier, jaws in fish were invented. Various sorts of dentition, including this crushing array here, are very suitable for grinding up trilobites. <coughs> My point here is that trilobites were going to go extinct come what may. If there had not been a Permian mass extinction, they might have tottered onto the Jurassic. Frankly, I couldn't care less. It doesn't matter. Even if they survived to the present day, they would be rare and unimportant. They were on the way out. And this, of course, has a bearing on some other aspects, because here we are in Oxford, and if only in Oxford am I allowed to say this, because when I show this picture, I like to say, here we have the graduation ceremony. <laughs> the degree ceremony in Oxford, all those dinosaurs, there's Richard Blesson and all the rest of it. Yes, yes, indeed. So we know these are extinct, because, of course, I explained already that there was a, a, an asteroid combined with, with volcanism, and the general idea has been that mammals were coexisting with the dinosaurs. That's undoubtedly correct. But also, it's pretty clear, at least at first sight, that these mammals were extremely small. They were like small versions of mice. And here we have the lower jaw of one such Cretaceous mammal. And you can see that the scale gives you some idea of how, about how tiny these creatures must have been. So the general idea, of course, is after this catastrophe, the dinosaurs go extinct. Um, but but the, 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 the mammals pull through, as do the birds, and so, you know, the day after, here's Reepajee. Uh, Anybody there? Any, hey, Frank, Frank, they've gone. What do you mean, gone, 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 they've gone, I tell you. And they so, said, well, all right, okay, now what did Darwin to us tell us? Let's evolve, get a move on, yeah, and off they go. <laughs> and then they repopulate the ecology in not exactly the twinkling in eye, but... Um, you're, you're getting the place repopulated by all sorts of remarkable forms. There's a little bit of a twist in this. First of all, by no means all the Cretaceous mammals were small. This chap here from China grew something in the order of a metre in length and had baby dinosaurs for breakfast because they're found in its gut. These are guys which are obviously, you know, not uh, quite, really quite dangerous. Second of all, is that if we look at the group which we belong to, which are known as the placentals, versus the group which is most familiar now from Australia but has a rich fossil record, that is the marsupials, we first of all see that their common divergence time was deep in the Jurassic, and both in the case of the placentals and the marsupials, they were already beginning to diversify during the Cretaceous. So we can say, well, what would have happened if that asteroid, and let's just make things simple, say the asteroid is the sole driver of this mass extinction, instead of impacting at Chisholm, and Yucatan has skipped across the top of the atmosphere and then vanished out into outer space. The day after, what would have happened? It'd been exactly the same, of course. Lots of dinosaurs around, if that's true. And a number of mammals and birds as well, fine and large. But the consequence of that, as Stephen Jay Gould in particular, but many other people have insisted, is that because the dinosaurs did not go extinct and the corresponding reptiles which flew in the air and inhabited the oceans, there would, of course, be no bats, because there were pterosaurs. There would have been no whales, because there were mosasaurs. And most importantly, and Gould made a great song and dance about this, indeed he referred to this asteroid as, quote, our lucky star. There wouldn't have been any primates, so if there were no primates, no monkeys, no apes, no us. So this seems to be one of these extraordinary fulcrum points in evolution, whereby the fortuitous arrival of a large rock from outer space radically redetermines how evolution goes. But in this counterfactual world where the asteroid misses, something else is going to happen around about 20 million years later in the Oligocene. And that is that the planet begins to refrigerate. It goes into ice ages, which continue, though it's difficult to believe today, to the present day. Ice ages have got nothing to do with asteroids or volcanism or anything of that sort of thing. It's a connection of carbon dioxide drawdown, reconfiguration of oceans, and continental masses and all the rest of it. But what I want to invite you to think about <coughs> is a counterfactual world whereby the temperate and polar area has become increasingly refrigerated. The tropics, of course, remain full of dinosaurs. Just to the present day, they're full of Komodo dragons and snakes and lizards and all those sorts of good things. But in the temperate and polar zones, groups which are warm-blooded, socially adept, and tend to make tools are going to get their evolutionary opportunity. And in this particular counterfactual world, 
because these animals are simply smarter than any dinosaur, or for that matter any reptile, although of course both were derived originally from reptiles, then sooner or later the day of the dinosaurs is going to come to an end. And this is dramatically shown by the couple of pictures here, in as much as what we've got here, as you can see, is a monkey, which is having a go at being bipedal. And uh, it's got an enormous <coughs> rock in its hands, as you can see, and we very much hope it's going to remove its foot before it drops a rock on the nut. <laughs> Because this is probably not so far from the sort of tool making we hominids were doing round about five million years ago. But the fascinating thing about this particular example is that this is a new world monkey, Cebus, Capuchin monkey, um, and this tool making is completely independent of the more celebrated tool making which we find in the chimpanzees, amongst other of the old world primates. And correspondingly, and in its own way, even more remarkable is the tool-making capacities of the New Caledonian crow. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into all the many details of this very interesting story. But suffice to say that they are able to construct these probes to extract grubs which are nutritious, which matters very much in a general story about brain evolution, as it so turns out, and can actually model these in different ways so that it is reasonable to claim that they have a proto-technology. This sort of tool-making far outstrips what any chimpanzee is capable of. But my point is, because of the convergences, even though they're too popular, of large brains of socially adept communities of tool making, sooner or later, a dinosaur is going to feel a spear thudding into its side. And when that happens, just as happened to that giant moa, then those animals are going to disappear. So the reason why I think mass extinctions are so interesting, and actually more, more interesting, is they actually give us time for nothing. They accelerate the inevitable. The trilobites were going to go extinct whether you liked it or not. The dinosaurs would have eventually gone extinct, but it would have taken a long, long time. There's no doubt about that. It seems to be that in the case of the end Cretaceous extinction, it probably shaved something like 40 or 60 million years off the historical calendar. If we recall that the overall life of our biosphere is round about 6 billion years, of which therefore we've got roughly a billion years left, then having a series of mass extinctions which bring the ante up every 100 million years is going to make a very considerable difference. So the myth of the mass extinctions is far from being destructive. Paradoxically, they're creative. Now, the next one, the myth of randomness, is one which, of course, is dear to most of the um, most Darwinian hearts. And this is the idea that you can go in almost any direction you like. And uh, well, I'm, you can almost guess what I'm going to say in this particular area, because, of course... The point about this is that when you begin to look at things slightly more closely, this is far from being the case. And there are at least two ways which we can look at this. One of this, I think, is actually uh, coming along now very rapidly. And it is that although biology typically looks at things which look squishy, and if they're left on the bench for more than a few days, they begin to smell, actually there is a sort of hidden geometry in a lot of life. And this is exemplified by the pearly nautilus here cut in half to show this beautiful logarithmic spiral whereby the chambers which in life allow the animal to float with facility are ones which actually um, allow a particular growth thing. And this, this growth pattern, in fact, follows the so-called Fibonacci series. And I do want the gentleman in particular to pay very close attention to the mathematical curves and in no way to be deflected by anything in this image. This would be quite wrong and naughty of you. The point about the Fibonacci spiral is this is very widespread in biology but it is responding to a geometry and a mathematics which one assumes is effectively inherent in the universe. In that sense, it's pre-existing. And it is becoming increasingly clear in biological systems that a substantial amount of complex organisation arrives by self-organisation. And this applies particularly, interesting to embryology. Quite how this self-organisation sort of manifests itself, what the rules of engagement are, are really not very clear at all. But this is something which suggests that you can have a Darwinian motor to do your sorting for you, but the self-organisational principles will once again assure that there are particular geometrical forms which will emerge through biological agencies. And the other aspect, which I only need, need to spend a minute on, is to do with evolutionary convergence. I mentioned the placental mammals. Here's a couple here. I mentioned also the marsupial mammals, and the marsupials, uh, the fathers have been pretty pleased with himself, or so he should, uh, because this is his baby here, and the baby is born, born at a much younger stage. Um, and one of the most celebrated examples of converging evolution is, of course, to do with these saber-toothed cats. This is one which is characteristic of the northern hemisphere, front view, side view of a saber-toothed cat from South America. You'll all know the denouement of this story, the reconstructions are, of course, that this cat is not a cat at all, it's a marsupial, 
this cat is a real cat, it's related to the tiger, the panther and the pussycat, but of course in terms of phylogenetics, this cat is far more closely related to a wombat, and this cat, real cat, is far more closely related to a, to a giraffe than they are to each other, and I think you'll agree that overall the similarities are very striking. And in parenthesis, although I make some play on this, although I'm also puzzled in descriptions of convergent evolution, even today, the adjectives are almost invariably ones of surprise, uncanny, surprising, remarkable. Why? This is Darwinian adaptation. What's surprise about it? Except that many times physicists, when I show pictures like this, have said, well, this reminds me in a sense of a sort of an attractor, so it's sort of analogous to the, to the, the self-organisation. So convergent evolution, I think, is a powerful argument against the randomness of evolution. Now, the myth of simplicity and the myth of, well, it will do, I need to go through very quickly, part, partly in view of the time. But um, the myth of simplicity, I'm not really going to say too much about, but this is the general view that you start with something cripplingly, slobberingly simple, and it gets more and more complex through geological time. As, as I've used a cliche elsewhere, once there were bacteria, now there's New York. Yeah, you know, this is, this is true, this is true. But actually, when you begin to understand, especially the genomics of supposedly primitive or simple organisms, they're not simple. It's actually incredibly difficult to find anything simple. Everything is complex, remarkably so. And alas, I don't have time to tell you, I'm just writing some articles at the moment to do with apparently very simple forms. But when you begin to understand them, they are fantastically sophisticated. It's not to say evolution doesn't happen. It's not to say that things don't eventually produce New York. The world, I think, today is much more interesting than it was two billion years ago. But even so, the myth of simplicity is one. And this is exemplified in the next slide. Now, I need to explain, if you haven't heard this talk in one form or another, um, I showed you one deeply politically and offensive, uh, politically incorrect slide. The next slide may be tricky for you, I'm afraid. And if you're a bit squeamish or anything like that, I just look away. And if you ask your neighbor to give you a nudge, and then you can look. So I apologize for this, but this is science. Bastard. <laughs> bastard. You're a bastard. You wouldn't, would you? This comes from a, a website known as Extreme Sports. <laughs> and of course, what it is is, is, is a, a fairly gentle dig at my friends in intelligent design, because this is part of the sort of idea of simplicity and so forth, where they would suggest, I think this is utterly erroneous, but I think the theology is much worse than the pseudoscience, that very complex things like the flagella motor, for example, could not possibly evolve. But I think you know, this is a, a complete misreading of the evidence. I can see why they think that. I'm sympathetic to that. Don't quote me on that. But I think I say they are utterly, utterly misguided. But the other area, and I'll skip that because of the time. Um, the other area which interests me very much is the well it will do. And this, again, is part of a standard Darwinian trope in as much as very recently and correctly, evolution has no foresight. It doesn't know where it's going. We know where we're going. And you might inquire how that comes about. But that's a slightly different story, perhaps. But nevertheless, the idea is you don't over-engineer biological systems. They have to be adaptively com competent, but no more than that. Well, this may be true, but I was talking to a friend uh, an hour or so back in the Earth Sciences here in Oxford, and we were exchanging notes about a particular enzyme, which works to an unbelievable degree of efficiency. And without it, you'd all be dead, so that may be of some use to you. But I want to mention very briefly what we see in terms of sensory systems, because this seems to be an interesting test case. Partly, of course, because we assume that in some sense our knowledge of the world is acquired through our senses. In brief, uh, many fish can detect electrical fields. Sharks are particularly famous in this regard. And they can detect electrical fields to the level of nanovolts. That is equivalent to a battery, the terminals of which, positive and negative, are separated by 10,000 kilometres. Not only that, and this is an aside, but the point of, of the shark's existence, they live in an electrically extremely noisy world because every time you flex your muscles, you're making electricity. So here they have this barrage of electrical signals through which they've got to filter the electrical signal which matters to them. Correspondingly, noses in principle can detect a single molecule. Ears, typified by the sonic bang, can work to the level of thermal noise. Eyes, potentially, can detect a single photon. In other words, biological sensory systems have reached the limits of the physical universe so far as biology is concerned. You can't go beyond a photon or a single molecule. You can't go beyond thermal noise. And in parenthesis, and I think this is non-trivial, although we take it for granted, scientific methodology, of course, is entirely instrument-driven. It's the instruments which do the work for us and we do the thinking. And this, of course, allows us to explore completely new worlds, which otherwise all of other biology would be completely blind to. And this may be a rather trivial point, but I think it's something which is worth emphasizing. Now, earlier on I mentioned the abundance of extrasolar planets. 
And this is another area where I think um, there's, there's, there's time for a little bit of rethinking. And this is my suggestion that there ought to be extraterrestrials everywhere. But they, if they are, then something very odd is going on. Because, as I mentioned, the number of planets... Of course, Kepler apparently is a bit crock at the moment, but there are new, there are new arrays being designed by the European Space Agency and by NASA. And there are improvements in technology which, before long, I'm told, will enable people to interrogate the nature of a potential atmosphere and then really begin to decide whether it's one which might be bearing life and the like. So this, again, is an extremely exciting time to be. But, famous last words, as of today, so far as I'm aware, total silence, nothing. No signals, nothing. No sign of any visits here, which I find slightly odd, because, you know, if you saw a large fossilised beach with a set of dinosaur footprints, and this is, again, what the creationists would want us to believe, and then beside it, the, 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 the footsteps of a visiting alien. I don't think it's completely impossible. Why not? Maybe they're told to sweep them up. as they go, I don't know, but, you know. But nevertheless, this, this, this so-called great silence is something which um, may suddenly be resolved tomorrow, but certainly seems to be a problem. And we can have a lot of fun imagining what these extraterrestrials might be like. I, I particularly enjoy this one, taken slightly at random, in as much as the artist has done his level best to make something look really extraterrestrial. But any biologist will immediately see the terrestrial thinking which goes into this insectoid-like figure. What we can deduce immediately from this, of course, is that this is a low-gravity planet which enables it to have this attenuated form here. Evolutionary convergence and basic standard physical principles like Reynolds' number and the like will, I, in my opinion, entirely dictate what extraterrestrials will be like. In other words, you can have a low-gravity planet, we can adjust. We can have an atmosphere as thick as that of Venus, which is equivalent to a kilometre of seawater. We can, again, model what biological forms you have because of various invariants, not least the Reynolds number, as I mentioned. But the point is, if there are extraterrestrials, and there ought to be, do you actually want to meet them? Now, here's a cautionary tale which struck me very forcibly some years ago. Inasmuch as, uh, in terms of advanced social systems, we are perhaps more familiar with mammals and birds and that sort of thing. But of course, the social insects are major competitors. And amongst those, there are many different sorts. But the bees attract our attention for a number of reasons. And they are remarkably interesting because, of course, they harvest the pollen. They live in very large colonies. They sleep. I think they probably dream as it so happens. Uh, they also communicate by their waggle dance and all the rest of it. And they are highly coordinated, including quorum sensing when they have their, their when they swarm and all the rest of it. So they're a very sort of fascinating group. But the point about them then is that it so turns out that the fossil record of the bees, especially thanks to amber, is rather good. And by investigating the limb structures, the leg structures here, you can make some inferences about the sort of food they were collecting and the likely social structure. And what the fossil record apparently shows is that there are a very large number of social systems amongst the extinct bees. But the, all these social systems are now extinct. Really, uh, there's a slight simplification, but it's really the stingless bees and the honeybees which are in charge at the moment. And the people writing this paper said, this is very interesting, because it does seem that there were many social, sim many social systems which have gone to the wall, and it's a reasonable assumption that they've gone to the wall because of competitive interactions with other, with other bee species. And then they said, well, there's something else which has struck us, you know, because we can think of another species which is also socially extremely complex, communicates, stores food, defends itself when it's threatened, uh, man manages to do all sorts of remarkable things in a highly organised way. And, of course, we all know who we're talking about. We're talking, of course, about ourselves. And this is not a happy picture, obviously, enough, and one hopes that, you know, things are getting better, but <laughs> you only have to read today's news to suggest that, actually, as I mentioned in passing about my despair with the European situation and the belligerence of the pre-First World War uh, nations, is that I don't know a great deal of history, but it seems to me that the little I read about the Aztecs, Tamerlane, Genghis Khan, Hitler, no thank you, very much, thank you. And it's not automatically clear to me that a invasive species would necessarily be benign. It might be, but I wouldn't put any money on it. <coughs> So I've said it many times in the past, if there are any extraterrestrials and they phone, just put it down and say we're busy. You know? just, just don't answer. Just say, you know, call back some other time. But I think that Enrico Fermi, who devised the famous Fermi paradox of where are they, where are all these extraterrestrials, is actually correct. And the reason I'm a little bit more optimistic about this is one of the results of the extrasolar planet investigations has been that it's now clear that many solar systems formed far, far in advance of ours. We're about 4.6 billion years old. 
there are similar social, uh, similar solar systems, excuse me, which date back to at least eight billion years. So, if you subscribe to normal rates of evolution, if you subscribe to some of the ideas of convergence, then there would be intelligent species which have got a head start of billions of years. And again, if you just look at the diaspora of humans across this planet, this may or may not be a fair analogy. Fascinatingly, New Zealand was only colonised at about the time of Henry III of this country, 1250 thereabouts, very, very recently. Easter Island, maybe a bit before that. But if all these places were going to be discovered because there was a search strategy. So one could imagine a diaspora across the galaxy that once it got underway under the normal geometrical principles would probably cover most of the galaxy in a few million years. And if they arrived at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, which is perfectly reasonable, we would be literally toast. We'd be on toast. They're the darling little fish. That's us. On toast. Delicious. The squeeze of lemon. Very nice too. So that, again, is very sobering indeed. One can, of course, see escape clauses. One is actually the origin of life is far more difficult than people think. That's possible. Another possibility, of course, is in fact we're surrounded by extraterrestrials, but we're far too thick to identify them. They may be there, but we just don't know what to look for, and that's something science is rather good at when it asks the right sort of question. Now, the last one I want to talk very briefly about, and the last bit if we have time, and I'll wait for the chairman to shut me up as well, because you know, we, we're, going, we, we're going dangerously close drinkers, is the, the myth of mentality. And this, and I know, I think it's fair to say, and Michael can respond if he wishes, of course, Michael Roos, um, I think this is the big one myself. Uh, others are less persuaded. They think it's all going to be sorted out. But my view is that the nature of consciousness, and again, we've had some, uh, uh, Peter and I have had some discussions about this, um, is, is profoundly difficult to understand. In fact, there is a school of thought, which is not trivial, that we can't understand it because we're not clever enough. We just, you know, we, we weren't, as Darwinian objects, we were not designed to understand ourselves in any case. The universe becomes self-aware through us and perhaps other species. But it may be that in some way this realm is something which to us is permanently inaccessible. I don't think that's right in a rather woolly way, but it's, it's, it's worth remembering. And I think um, this, this is a view which is held by some people. It sounds like a, a council of despair, but I'm not, I'm not so sure. So how might we deal with this? Well, this is all standard territory, but it's not one I'm particularly familiar with. But I just want to talk very briefly, not so much about the concept of the famous qualia, the nature of the red sunset and so forth. What, what are these colours? Because, of course, I don't have to remind you that even if you're looking at this, at this picture here, you're, you're not seeing anything at all. Of course not. Your optic lobes at the back of your skull are busy interpreting this sort of thing. And there are certain shifts in some of the... Um, uh, some of the retinal proteins which enable you to distinguish those particular colours. And if you, if you change those, of course, if you have a sex linked mutation which affects about 10% of males, then you won't see some of those colours either. They're, not, they're literally invisible to you. But one which I've been dwelling a bit about, and I apologise because I was talking about this last year to a somewhat similar question, which I think in a way is a rather interesting test case, and um, it's still sort of going on at the back of my mind, but it revolves around the concepts of what's known as numerosity. And this is important because... Numerosity and the appreciation of numbers, we suppose, in some sense underpins the rest of mathematics. And certainly speaking as a Cambridge Don, it's, and also the secretary of my wine committee, um, it's of very considerable importance to know whether you've got two bottles and one glass, or three bottles and one, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, the, 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 the actual business of distinguishing numbers is, 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 is quite important. And effectively, and um, I probably get some of the details wrong now, but so far as the perception of numbers is concerned, there's a rather important distinction between up to recognising four objects, which seems to involve a somewhat different process in the brain, and it's effectively instantaneous. Everybody can do that. You know, one to four, but you recognise it straight away. Whereas when you're given a large number of, of objects, um, you approximate. And there are various ways in which this particular approximation can be arrived at. And to the first approximation, so to speak, it doesn't really matter very much. Because after all, who cares whether it's 300 beans or 400? You know, you're, you're dealing in an averaging world. You don't need to know this unless you are, for instance, a mathematician or a scientist. And why this matters is that this capacity for numerosity is something which is very clearly expressed in animals. And although standard experiments might involve the chimpanzee and, 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 the like, uh, and similar forms, there's a very famous paper, at least in, in that part of the literature, which compares the capacity of numerosity between fish known as guppies and undergraduates. And you'll be pleased to hear they're both equally competent. And those of you who teach will probably say, yeah, that's what I always expected, but never mind. In the case of numerosity, 
on the averaging system, what one can do is distinguish between what's known as numerical magnitude and numerical distance. And why this is important is that its early understanding was in terms of weights, but it actually applies to all sensory systems, including numerosity, which in effect says that as a human, if I, have an, uh, if I have a weight in my hand, and in parentheses, this is why the metric system so is bonkers, because it's not a human scale system, and that's another story. If I have a weight, let us say two ounces, and inquire, what is the minimum amount I need to either take away or add to perceive a difference? It turns out, in fact, that the distribution follows the famous Fechner law, which is effectively logarithmic like this. What this means is that if you have rather small weights, then you can add or take away a rather small amount to perceive that difference. But if you have a large weight, a little bit like that stone, the monkey and its hand, you can add a substantial amount before you perceive the difference. What is so fascinating is the Fechner law applies also to numerosity. It's the same sensory process, so that weight or hearing or seeing numbers all follow the same psychophysical laws. And this in my view, though I'm not a philosopher, and I'll probably be corrected immediately, seems to be to be an absolute acid test as to the notion in which we might believe in abstract quantities. Because sensory things we assume just flow in one way or another, yet we as mathematicians extract subtract abstract entities which then engage in their own life and have their own richness and engagement in other sorts of respects. And there's an interesting test case for this even amongst the humans. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of this tribe from Brazil. But these particular people are rather unusual, perhaps due to isolation. Who can say? But if you look at their capacity for numerosity, they have words for around about four. They sort of get five in one hand. But after that, they sort of just say, oh, it's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. They don't have this precise area. So in other words, the numerosity which you might have noticed was displayed by the chimpanzee, and there's no other comparison intended at all, obviously, um, which uh, animals engage in, without language, which is engaging with numbers, actually shows exactly the same sort of distribution. So there's an added possibility, and this is highly debated, but I think again bears on the question of consciousness, as to whether language is integral. And if language is unique to humans, then you could make a wild claim that only humans are conscious. And at the moment, I've started to write a new book called Is My Dog Conscious? And effectively, what one's trying to say is, yes, of course, it is in one way, but no, in other ways, it's not. And how does one resolve that? And so then this leads on to the general question of the origin of mathematics, which I'm certainly not one which is competent to deal with at all. The general feeling amongst the people who work on animal numerosity, I think it's fair to say, is that by displaying this neural capacity for numerosity, especially the, 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 ma the main one that's been used as a rhesus monkey, is that this is, in a sense, allowing these animals to step into the threshold of mathematics. I, I think this is completely and utterly incorrect. It's got nothing, in a sense, to do with mathematics. Now, it is the case also that highly acculturated animals, such as Alex the parrot and like, can apparently engage in a sort of mathematics. And if you ask Alex what 5 plus 0 is, he'll tell you it's 6. It's not bad in a manner of speaking. But of course, one's got to remember again, and I was very struck by this some years ago when I was doing a little bit of television with some colleagues on the intelligence of crows and their cognitive capacities. And I think, again, this is non-trivial. Not all, but many of the experiments are dealing with animals which are in constant human <coughs> contact. They are being constantly costed, talked to, petted, encouraged, and everything else. There's nothing wrong with this, because, of course, that's part of our understanding of the biosphere, if you like. But the idea that the things which ultimately lead to deep mathematics are directly linked in an abstract way to the capacities for numerosity, I think, is a massive misunderstanding. It goes beyond that, of course, in terms of what the mentality of this might be, because it does suggest to me, as it does to some mathematicians, that one is dealing with things which are at least analogous to platonic figures. There are alternative views, of course, which simply say, first of all, there are many different sorts of mathematics, and not all of them are by any sense commensurate. And in addition to that, it is claimed by such people as Morris Klein, for example, who's a very distinguished man in his own right, of course, that this mathematics is something which is, again, a complete human invention. But I think it'd be fair to say the majority of mathematicians more feel that they're discovering rather than they're actually making things up as they go along. How are we doing for time, Peter? It's um, 
should be another five. No, sure. Let me just see what else I've got to tell you. Okay, yeah. So, this argument for numerosity is one which extends beyond that in a very interesting way, which I think, again, is a test case for men mental states. Because many years ago, Francis Galton, the cousin, of course, of, of, of Charles Darwin, uh, wrote a fairly entertaining and very short paper where he learned how to do mathematics by smell. So he associated different things like peppermint with particular numbers. And he found very quickly that by putting these different smells in different orders, he could multiply and subtract and do everything else. So again, that is the sense that irrespective of how those numbers are presented to the brain, although we tend to associate it with visual, of course a blind person could do it through braille and so on and so forth. And the idea here is that whatever the inputs might be into the brain, there's somehow a sort of superior processing centre which allows this thing, first of all, to make sense of numbers, irrespective of whether they come through your nose or through your fingers or through your eyes. But to my way of thinking, this seems to me, and I don't want to be too rude about this, but almost the same about, as talking about phlogiston. This, this is just an area of, of complete make-believe. It's just more it's got to say, well, this system has got to work in this way, and therefore this is the way it's got to work. And it seems to have nothing at all to do, not least, with the powers of mathematics, which are incredibly powerful. So, in conclusion, um, I had a few other things I could have added, but they're not important for the, for the present one. I was enormously impressed by David Stowe's book, Darwinian Fairy Tales. I liked it very much, first of all, because it, it's a set of essays rather than a, a connected narrative. It's also extremely amusing. It's also deeply, deeply politically incorrect. And I approve of all of those things. But what Stove is trying to tell us is that if you're going to persuade me as a philosopher working in Sydney, he's dead now, but he was a philosopher there, that the seamless extrapolation, which is otherwise thought to connect in terms of things such as ethics and altruism between our immediate ancestors and the human here. In a nutshell, you've got to be joking. It's just mad. And I think he has a point. And of course, it's a little bit like, is my dog conscious? Well, yes it is, and no it isn't. Are humans unique? Well, of course they aren't, but of course they are. And it's deciding how you want to resolve those particular questions. And amongst the things Stove points out is an apparently trivial example that we have an inordinate love of pets. But if you think about it for a moment, bringing in a parasite-laden carnivore into your family is not exactly the most sensible thing to do. But it is part of our empathy. But what really impresses me about Stove, apart from his ability to write with conviction and, and clarity and amusement, is he was an atheist. And he was also an expert on David Hume. So he had no axes to grind here. He wasn't trying to say, oh, you know, there's some mysterious hocus-pocus in the Garden of Eden or any this sort of business. He wasn't interested in that. He just said, as a philosopher, I can't see how we make that connection. And if you don't know the book, I certainly recommend it to you. The thing which, of course, interests me as much in terms of where humans are going is, here we are in, in Barcelona, I think, is what's next? Where are we going to go beyond this? And I'll finish with this slide here, which I've told many times in the past, and in a sense is almost a reprise of what I've tried to, to tell you, if not persuade you. And it's to do with the nature of what's called animal music, and an essay by Patricia Gray in Science, uh, some years ago now. And as you all know, many animals, including the male humpback whale, hear songbirds and a number of others engage in song. And this song has a whole series of fascinating convergent parallels with human music. And they point out, in their essay, of course, that the convergence can be explained at the level of a physical vibration of columns of air. That's perfectly reasonable, and that's correct, I'm sure. There are other stories as well, only some groups sing and, and all the rest of it. But they then went, I think, much further in a much more exciting direction and said, well, supposing there is, quote, a universal music out there, and, you know, those of you who are philosophers will be very familiar with these sorts of concepts. And this is not some sort of universal hum but it is, in a sense, the way one accesses music. Now, once again, you can see, just from a straightforward materialist viewpoint and all the rest of it, or a cultural viewpoint, there may be many other levels of explanation. But I think she sort of hits the nail in the same way as one does with mathematics. And I'm neither mathematical nor musical, unlike my youngest son, but very often those two go together. But I know enough music and listen to enough music to realise 
that there really is a spectrum of ability and there's an awful lot of good music but there are a handful of people who just take you that much further and you might be able to explain that but there's certain passages in Mozart in particular and Wagner in a rather different context which to my way of thinking suggests that actually one should not be in the least bit embarrassed about this non-material world which we access and indeed, as I've said elsewhere, my own view, evolution is simply a search engine to allow the universe to become self-aware. And in that sense, Darwin was absolutely right. But from that sense, that's not a terribly interesting thing to say. But I think the prospect that one might actually be now going into completely new territory might even have a theological uh, or philosophical resonance. So my sincere apologies for all the mix-ups to begin with and, and for your patience in a rather hot room. And um, I'll finish there and thank you again, Peter, very much for your time and patience as well. Thank you. Thank you. I take questions here. Yes, if you wish. Okay, okay. Sure. folks, we have our, our term is at pointless drinks at 6.30. Uh, so we, we have about 20 minutes, I would say, for questions. So if you have a question, um, you, you know the drill. Um, but if you could wait until uh, uh, Ian or someone gives you a microphone, uh, and it'd probably be helpful to say who you are um, before you ask the question. So, uh, one and two. Okay. You're next. Is this on? Is it on? Okay. Uh, so, Simon, thanks. I'm, I'm so, David Tsipkowski. Um, okay, so just to take the, the first myth, the mass extinctions. Um, I'm, I have no problem with um, the, you know, so the, the basic point that you make, which seems to be that those groups that are kind of on the way out anyway tend to get finished off in mass extinctions. And I don't think anybody would have, would, you know, would, would have an argument with that. But I'm wondering if you, know, you might not acknowledge that the story is, a, or the scenario is a little bit more complicated than that, right? I mean, when you look at major groups that get finished off, like the trilobites, it's a, it's a really easy case to make, and you can say, in a sense, that there was a kind of inevitab an inevitability there, and, and it just got sped up. But what about cases um, you know, where you have groups, you, uh, looking at, say, families or orders, where a large number of genera or species are lost, but the, the entire group isn't finished mm -hmm. off. But what you do lose is a whole lot of um, you know, genomic diversity. Um, you could make the argument then that the mass extinction has, you know, created a bottleneck, and even if, in a kind of morphological and ecological sense, there's a recovery and um, you get, you know, things down the line that are, you know, not that different than what might have still been there um, had the mass extinction not taken place. You've, you've, you know, you've mm. lost a lot of genetic diversity, potential genetic diversity, and, and in that sense, um, you, you have reshuffled the deck. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, so I guess I'm just wondering, is, is, is the point you're making a, a little bit too easy of a point, and what about you know, the bottleneck function? What about the, the genomic diversity that's lost potentially in mass extinctions? Because that seems to be a large part of what you know, people like Jablonski are, are interested in when they're talking about you know, recoveries yeah. from mass extinctions. Yeah. Thanks. No, Thank you, David. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult call and a difficult question. Um, and I, I, in a way, I think it's almost how you choose to look at the question. So what you say is, is indubitably correct. It, it's really, does it make any difference? Does it, do, who cares? And when you talk about genomic diversity, um, as we both know very well, that's begging all sorts of questions about, you know, what, what, you know, as if somehow genomic diversity is some special thing which is to be treasured or whatever. And we know perfectly well that one can recruit from almost any set of combinations and re-establish things. Um, so part of my reply would be, first of all, not, of course, to dispute that these orders and so forth go extinct, nor indeed to dispute some of David Jablonski's observations, especially with regard to the Cretaceous, where there are ones which are more or less likely to go extinct. I mean, there's a real world, there are biogeographic filters, there are groups which have larval forms which ought to be more vulnerable to extinction, but as Charlotte Jeffrey and others have shown, are not. So there are lots and lots of nuances through all of this story. But I think the way I look at it is effectively several fold. And I'm glad you didn't mention, because I was rather hoping you would, and then I'd be able to get my axe down and really give it a good one, 
is, of course, with regard to the Permo-Triassic extinctions and the ships that pass in the night and the brachypods and the bivalves. So I, as a paleontologist, if I go to the Paleozoic, really find lots and lots and lots of brachypods, and I don't find very many bivalves. If I go into the Mesozoic, there are some brachypods, but many, many more bivalves. And Gould and Callaway's famous paper was that these were ships that passed in the night because they weren't in competitive interaction. It was simply one went one way, one went the other way. It could have gone in some other sort of way. Uh, that turns out, in fact, your dad uh, made a contribution to this area, which I, 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 I think is correct. Um, first of all, there is some reasonable evidence of competitive interaction, but in fact, some much more recent work published in the last six months has shown not only do we know well that the bivalves, principally here talking about a marine setting, are steadily migrating offshore, steadily occupying more and more of the ecospace during the um, Paleozoic, but much more remarkably, it turns out that if you just look at the sheer amount of tissue tied up in bivalves and other mollusks versus brachypods, the mollusks are winning hands down from the Devonian onwards. There are lots and lots of brachypods, but they just don't have the metabolic firepower of the bivalves. They just don't have the versatility of the mollusks, including things which, of course, include cephalopods and the like. So correspondingly, with arguments to do with the loss of the dinosaurs and so forth, you could say, yes, they survive as birds, blah, 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 blah. But what I'm more interested in, in a nutshell, is biological properties. I frankly don't give a hang where they come from, and I'm not too concerned where they go to. What I really want to know is, you know, does this radically redirect where evolution is going? And I think in just a Darwinian context of increasing competition, it's not a happy story, but those, dino those trilobites going to the wall is part of that struggle for existence. So, of course you're right, and if you're interested in the specific question as you pose it, I can't quarrel with it. But I think if you sort of say, well, in the grand scheme of things, are you interested in the emergence of an acculturated tool-making bipedal form which hunts moa, which I am, how likely is that from the Cameron explosion? And I would say, give me a billion years or give me 300 million years, I can do it for you. That's, that's the, it's the way you look at the world. And this is not in any way a put-down. It, it's, it's, I think, why it's a myth. Okay, I have this, this gentleman here, and then uh, Andrew at the front, and, and then I do see you up the back if we have time. Ken Wagamuth, geologist from the United States. Uh, we have the evidence of the Chicxulub impact that is both in North America as well as over here in Europe, sure. right at about 64, 65, 66 million years from the uh, radiometric dating yep. of the uh, tectites. What magnitude of influence do you think volcanism has in relationship to the asteroid impact of influencing the demise? Second question is, approximately how many millions of years was the, was the die-off of the dinosaurs? And uh, in another end of the group of species, say of planktonic forams, say foraminiferas, what kind of million, uh, millions of years time window do they die out and then repopulate the oceans? Sure, thank you. They're, 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 they're big questions. I'll, I'll deal, if you don't mind, with the second one first. It's quite controversial. I was talking to somebody who got very cross when I mentioned this. There's a little bit of evidence that dinosaurs might have survived for as much as 100,000 years after the mass extinction. It's a complicated argument to do some very precise radiometric dating. I think it's material from Colorado. But the consensus seems to be that this is unlikely. So lo most probably the dinosaurs went extinct very rapidly. The planktonic forearms, I'm not an expert in this area, but the, the, the basic story is that in all the mass extinctions, and this was applies also to the end Permium event, things bounce back really quickly, more quickly than was thought. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's twists and turns all over this. There's different sorts of paper and argument and all the rest. But nevertheless, it, the biosphere generally recovers very, very quickly. There's a little twist in this, which is actually very interesting, because if you look at the fossil record, there's some reason to think that the post-Permium catastrophe fossil record is absolutely appalling. But this may not be only because everybody was very, very unhappy. It also may be because the processes of fossilization and the sorts of sedimentology you have have also been um, changed. It's especially true of the plant story. So you have to be careful. The fossil record too often is regarded as an open book. It's a much more subtle thing than that, as it so happens. The other question about volcanism and asteroids um, is that Almost without exception, I was very sceptical about this some years ago, but a French geophysicist, Vincent Cortelot, um, showed very convincingly that all the mass extinctions are associated with volcanism. 
Now, the asteroid impact, and of course the wonderful work by the Alvarez team and all the other work to do with the iridium and the tectites and all this good stuff, is absolutely correct and deeply interesting. And my view is that actually mass extinctions are the result of mass volcanism, and that's equally true for the end of the Cretaceous because this is the time of the Deccan eruptions. Okay, that's all fine and large. Um, it seems to me that the asteroid was the last thing you wanted, you know, when things were bad enough. But there is another thing, and I don't mean to be unkind of this because I'm going to the States on Thursday and I like the country very much, but it just so happened that that asteroid impacted an area which 65 million years later was going to be densely populated with a large number of intelligent vertebrate paleontologists. Okay? <laughs> And the concentration of effort there has, in a certain sense, because there are more or less complete sections in much of the Western interior, and the many other parts of the world do not have complete sections across the terrestrial interval. So we don't actually know very much at all about what happened in South America or South Af the Southern Africa, for instance, in comparison to the wonderful work that's been done there. So, yeah, no, that... that I think if the, if the asteroid hadn't hit, there was certainly a mass extinction. It probably made things 20% worse, would be my, my guess. It's really bad luck. They're right in the middle of this massive eruptions in the, in the, in, in the centre of the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Pinson, uh, Oxford. Um, I want to ask a slightly offbeat question on behalf of an endangered species. I speak, of course, of the university. Um, uh, the Western University may be facing its own mass extinction, um, and the mass extinction is coming from an attitude change, that the, the job of the university is only to do useful things, mm -hmm. um, and material things, to help with production. Whereas, of course, uh, in traditional philosophy, um, the great masters of the Western thought, um, the job is to do is, uh, the highest operations in the mind are to do useless things. Now, one offbeat, now one, one offbeat like um, European discourses, for example, um, now, one question I've want, long wanted to ask, um, offbeat question, um, is there any evidence that you've seen in your study of the natural world of many years that animals do things just for their own sake, not simply to pass on their oh, yeah. genes, to just um, uh, to, to propagate? Um, uh, that, that last slide made me think of this question. So, uh, no, a slightly you. offbeat speculative question, is there anything for, their own, for, for its own sake that animals might be interested in? Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, there is, yeah, no, no. They, um, it's very, very, very crudely, it's, it's slightly depressingly uh, connected to cognitive capacity. So amongst the more intelligent birds, uh, parrots, crows in particular, the kea in, um, uh, kea in, sorry, in New Zealand is a nice example, this high-altitude parrot. I don't, I think, have any pictures. I could probably find some pictures here, but we won't waste time. Um, amongst the mammals, with only a few exceptions, uh, they are playful. Uh, they enjoy fooling around. And, I, you know, and as ever, there is an anthropomorphic risk here. The same thing with, is my dog conscious and all the rest of it. Um, I've really in too much this area. But uh, one, gets the, one gets the impression amongst various groups of animals, that the, especially, that they enjoy goofing around. They really do. Um, and this capacity for playfulness actually goes uh, quite a bit deeper than that. Um, there's some evidence of playfulness in some fish, some which do actually have an interesting enlarged brain, the mormarids. And also, there's a couple of rather weird anecdotes about reptiles. There's a turtle in particular. I'll give you the literature if you want it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I don't want to get stuck in, into the, the general business about the university at threat and all, all the rest of it. I, I won't say anything. I, I have my own views on this. I don't think things, although I'm so pessimistic about Europe, I, I don't think we should be over-pessimistic about the university at all, actually. My name is Herman Philips from the Netherlands. Uh, I greatly enjoyed your talk. We only have a few minutes left, so do you mind when I move from myth number one to myth number two, the myth of randomness? Um, if I understood you well, you said that there were interesting physical causes of mutations, and you think that this refutes the myth of randomness, and one of the causes you mentioned is self-organization. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't carefully define randomness in the bio biological sense. Of course, nobody would say that mutations are not caused. Nobody would say that there are not physical limits to these causes. But the, the definition is only that there is no systematic link mm. between the causes on the one hand and sure. adaptiveness on the other hand. Now, would you deny randomness in that sense? 
Uh, no, of course I wouldn't, <laughs> said he ah, gently. Right. No. <laughs> no, it's not. No, the myth is, uh, to begin with, I, I don't think mutations are terribly interesting. <laughs> okay. I mean, of course mutations happen, and if you do directive mutagenesis, then you can change things in a particular way. What is, I think, pretty clear now is that the way the genome operates is far, far more complicated than that. And it's not, of course, to say that you can't have mutations, and then what, what's interesting, apart from anything else, is the sensitivity of many of the systems. You make a single amino acid change, as you probably know, the system basically falls apart. Other places you can change things very, very substantially. No, by the rhythm, man, man, randomness... Um, in essence, with all of these things, it's not to dispute you know, that the random things happen. Of course, that, you know, of course I, I, I'm not a mathematician, but I know a little bit uh, enough to say you, know, you don't use the word randomness lightly, that's for certain. It is the whole perceived set of world pictures which come with a particular neo-Darwinian outlook. And these things translate, especially, though by no means uniquely, into philosophy. Because my view is, and, and David, at the background, I'd be very happy to be corrected in this view, but my understanding of a large part of the motor of Stephen Jay Gould's energy was that I understand that part of his family came from Hungary. Some of those were Hungarian Jews. Some of them were exterminated uh, by the Nazis. And he was of the view, that, uh, which is very common, of course, in Enlightenment Europe, that if somehow we could, and if this is my quarrel with the existing European system, this, ide this idealised state which comes from, from the French perspective, which I think is utterly uh, mistaken, but that's another story, is that one could make a world which would be perfect. And therefore, if we were just pure accidents of chance through 500 million years of negotiation from the Cameron explosion, we didn't, in a sense, have any burden there was nothing we had to worry about. We weren't taking anything forward. And, of course, we know this perfectly well, the people who went to the New World from Europe, one of the reasons they were so keen to get there was to escape from the degree of repressive burdens which was characteristic of much of the continent in the 17th and 18th century. So it was perfectly reasonable for them, for them to do. But the, the danger with all these philosophical importations which are imagining that some biological insight which can then be applied to these areas is, in my view even though I'm making a similar set of arguments, they are, unless you start to look at them carefully, extremely dangerous. Because these things translate into things such as educational policy. I see I do not persuade you. Well, it's not related to my question anymore, actually. No, okay, that's fair, no, that's fair enough. No, that's fair enough, yeah. But I don't, dis I don't dispute mutations, sure. Okay. All right. okay. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, sure, thanks. I think we have uh, this time for one more, and then... Uh, Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, as Europe has come up so much, I should probably mention this in regards to my question. It's a sort of comment leading into the question. I would suggest that I'm from the University of Edinburgh and my sort of pessimism with Europe is that the English will spoil it and they'll wreck the party <laughs> for everyone because, they've ne because at an unconscious level uh, the experience is that the English have never managed to get over the fact they don't have an empire so they'll ruin the party for everyone else. So that would be my pessimism and extreme danger we'll, about Europe. We'll, we'll talk about this after. Secondly... <laughs> but do remember, by the way, I'm half Scottish so it's okay, Maxwell's and Stuart's well, that's, so that, in front of that's, that's okay, we're a, we're a bit more optimistic about the whole thing up north. <laughs> The question I wanted to ask was, and it, it kind of does relate to that, is that do you feel that in terms of philosophy there could be room for a sort of return of Spinoza in a modern sense? And I'm thinking about how you were talking about the idea of cognitive density, a teleological endpoint and evolution moving towards something. And if you do a careful and close examination of his ethics, when you get to the final section, the whole sense of his nature, God being the same thing. The mm. teleological end point is that the mind itself through self-reflexivity moves into a space of eternity whereupon consciousness evolves into a new species and that that would be what the next phase leap in human evolution would be. And that, for example, when you said, is my dog conscious? Well, Spinoza would say to a lesser extent than you are, but yes, because of interconnective density. And so would Freud. And in that final regard, I would suggest that perhaps in terms of extinction, if you consider Spinoza via a sort of psychoanalytic viewpoint, where Klein would argue that the disintegration of the organism is an internal psychic failure, 
the image that you had of you know, the FBI people in America with 9-11, I would argue that America is much more at risk of that sort of failure in terms of biological trajectory than, for example, the common psychic space of Europe. So I just wonder what you think of it now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll take it without offence as more a commentary, simply because I'm very ill-informed Ill about Spinoza in particular. More often, the sort of talks I give, people inquire whether there's some resonance with Tyre to Shardai, but... Uh, I was going to mention Tyre, actually. Died. Yeah. No, no, that, that's fine. And, and I should know much more about... I haven't even read Roger Scruton's short book on Spinoza yet, I'm afraid. My, my, my sense is, yeah, that, in a sense, that's got to be correct. But I think also, and I'm happily to talk to you about Alex uh, uh, Salmon and other people who so wish, I mean... It does seem to me that there are political systems which are beneficial. And my own view, for instance, is one which is based on common law is a beneficial system because you explore, you don't dictate. And correspondingly, I'm sure there's a lot of historical memories about empires and so forth. And all of us carry that sort of particular burden of history. I don't dispute that either. And I can imagine that in a number of, in two cases at least in European history, the, the, the Mongol invasions in particular and subsequently Tamerlane, uh, things really could have gone very badly wrong for us. Very badly wrong indeed. Now, you can take a, a sort of dispensational view of history, if you like, and that such things might, might not have happened because something else would have come along the way. But what, what I think is one should never be um, negligent of the risks we engage with. Uh, my own view of America, I'm afraid to say, somewhat differs from yours, and I don't want to be particularly flattering to the Americans here, but I, I think that, in fact, its ability to reinvent itself and its ability that, despite numerous failings, to actually, again, find some areas of embedded justice is something which uh, I think will actually be our lifeline rather than otherwise, right? But, you know, there'll be other people who would think this is just a pipe dream. But we can talk about this afterwards over several bottles of wine, of course. But uh, the notion that we're still engaged on a adventure, you know, that one is still at an early stage, and I think that's reflected in part, though not too dramatically, by much of science because I think it'd be fair to say that most of us, uh, as scientists, think we're only just scratching the surface of what there might be to be known. And that, again, is my protest about the received wisdom, at least amongst the biologists, with the sort of, well, that's that, you know. Aren't we clever boys living in North Oxford? But, uh, by the way, you know. So that's really, I think, the, the, the nub of the question. And I must read more about Spinoza, but it does seem to me that we are now moving into utterly new territory. We have completely transcended what my dog is. Bless it. Spaniel, by the way. Okay. Right. On, on that note,